good evening ladies and gentlemen i am sankal popal and i take care of uh, business development at pms ai world i'm thankful to all of you for joining with us on uh, i think the ninth episode of nk alpha maven which we created with the intention of interacting with the top minds of uh, wealth management money management and overall financial services and uh, you know with that in mind we today have mr jaydeep hansraj from kotak uh, you know i i say jaydeep uh, hansraj from kotak because he has done many hats at kotak so you know you know limiting him to one particular business will be kind of a kind of an injustice and uh, with us uh, you know i'll just start with a set of introductions uh, you know uh, we have with us mr hansraj who uh, joined kotak about almost two and a half decades ago and across uh across these uh you know years he has managed many businesses at uh kotak mahindra as an institution currently he heads uh, kotak securities uh before that he was uh, the ceo of wealth management and priority banking he uh you know it's kind of a parallel that we can draw with him and the industry that has grown you know kind of collectively together you know his collective wisdom uh, will give us a lot of insight today Uh, he has scaled many businesses, developed many businesses under the Kotax, uh, you know, umbrella. And we're thankful for you. Uh, thankful that you are here, Mr. Hansraj, today. Uh, Thank you so much for having me over, uh, Shankar. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, with uh, you know, with us uh, today are the usual suspects, Mr. Vikas Sachdeva of uh, MK and Sachin Shah of MK. Vikas again has close to you know 25 years of experience. He's in the asset management business. He's a veteran. He uh, he has headed organizations like Edelweiss Asset Management in Am, uh, you know, uh, and now he he is the CEO of MK Investment Managers. He's also been a part of many SEBI committees uh, and AMFI committees. Uh, and accompanying him is Sachin Shah, the fund manager at MK Investment Managers, who uh, you know he is the proud uh, you know co uh, he is the proud uh, you know uh, author or the developer of a uh, framework called Ecall, which helps judge uh, managements and businesses. And uh, he's successfully managing his, uh, you know, PMS and AIF with uh, top-notch returns. And a little bit about PMS AIF World before we get into the last introduction for uh, this evening. PMS AIF World is one of India's top digital platforms uh, for alternates, and uh, we we always are a proponent of uh, invest invest uh, investments through informed decisions and conviction for the long term. And the last introduction today is for you guys. Uh, to you know, ask more questions is Finlearn Academy who will be sponsoring our best question award today. Okay, so Finlearn is uh, you know an online platform for learning about investing, trading, and everything related to the stock markets. So you can check out uh, check them out. And uh, a lucky winner who asks the best question today gets to win uh, a prize from them. So with that, let me introduce the topic a bit today, uh, which I think uh, sorry I said that would be the last introduction. But today's topic is very interesting. Vision and strategic intents of top wealth management firms in the five trillion dollar economy. So we've always spoken about uh, you know the wealth being created when Indian economy moves to uh, you know to add another couple of trillion dollars under its uh, you know umbrella. But what happens to the money that is created? How will it be managed? What are the top leading organizations envisaging about uh, managing this kind of money? And in general, what happens when a country creates massive amount of wealth as such? So that is what we will try to discuss. That is what we will try to apprehend with one of the top guys in the in the country today. So over to you, Vikas. And uh, I think I've done my set of introductions. Yeah, thank you so much, Uncle Ko. Uh, as always, it is my want to introduce the person behind the professional. I think we've we've uh, just heard a lot about Jaydeep, uh, but I just want to talk about him as a person. And uh, what I've heard about Jaydeep, some common adjectives which his colleagues, friends. Uh, talk about is he's a workaholic. He's extremely dedicated to his work. He's business focused. Uh, more importantly, his business acumen is at a different level. This is something which I've got from every person I've spoken to. Also, some of the other things I've heard. Uh, Jaydeep, you're a people's person. You're the go-to person for any employee. In fact, there are several uh, stories people talk about how you stood by employees in moments of crisis. So I think that uh, that was really very heartening to hear. Uh, on a more lighter note, you're a complete movie buff, and you're pretty omnivorous about your choices. But your favorites are the Godfather series, so I'm not trying to, you know, tell anything to your <laughs> <Kari> here. <laughs> he always has a twinkle in his eye, always good for a laugh, even at his expense. Uh, he's a big foodie, he, and therefore, by the way, 
there's a high chance that he's very high on any sporting activity in particular he's a gymming enthusiast he loves cycling and he plays badminton pretty well always the life of a party he loves old hindi songs and most people uh, confirm to me that you sing quite well jadi uh, you're a typical cancerian you enjoy the finer things in life i think one of the things everybody talks about you is that you're a huge tie collection uh, and you're very particular about the brands you want to wear which makes it very easy for colleagues to give you a gift when they want to uh you love watches you have quite the collection uh, but i think uh, what was surprising to me is that you actually love paintings and you pick up paintings after painstaking research and you've been doing that for 25 years now uh you're very particular about your wear you're often the trend setter amongst your colleagues and there is this incident which people uh, smile and tell me about that at one point of time you started wearing uh, you know those happy socks to office and very quickly everybody jumped on to the trend and started wearing happy socks uh, last but not the least a uh, complete and devoted family man uh, you know people tell me that you will always take your family call whether it's your wife archana your daughter sanjana or your son rahul whenever they call whatever you are doing whichever meeting you're sitting in you will take that call at that particular moment and last but not the least a uh, personal observation which i think resonates across all your colleagues also you're one of the most humble people i've come across you're still the same guy i used to know when we first met in the 90s so thank you so much adip uh, for for joining us uh, it's it's a pleasure having you here and uh, let me just dive straight into the topic and ask you the first question Sure. Uh, I think Sankapur did start alluding to it, and let me just uh, be a little bit more. Uh, uh, you know, most of us have been fortunate enough, you know, to start our careers around the same time SEBI was formed. You know, two and a half decades or ago. Or go the vintage in the Indian private sector financial services is also around two and a half decades. That's when we really started seeing the glass nose, which started happening in the Indian financial services sector. Probably started happening around that time. What, according to you? have been some of the more defining moments uh, that you would like to highlight uh, in this journey uh, first and foremost because thank you very much for the for the very very kind words i don't think i deserve you in 1% of whatever you said but uh, if you said it i i humbly accept uh, yeah it's actually a uh, and when you were uh, asking this question or when uh, we were talking about it some time back uh, uh, of the last 25 30 years uh, of uh, financial services wealth management etc etc uh, there have been just a plethora of uh, changes and uh, i i think uh, from what the world was uh, in financial services uh, in the early 90s when i got into this uh, piece and now in the early 2020s uh, when i'm the four years away from i'm the, the changes are just completely crazy but uh, i think uh, if you ask me uh, for jadeep uh, just can i request you to uh, get the mic a little bit closer yeah so sure, sure. is this better yeah this is better i think perfect uh, there been just just crazy number of changes uh, uh, i think uh, the big defining moment uh, is going to be a I, i i can't i can't pinpoint on one but i i'll, I'll, I'll try putting out three or four things which i think have been huge uh, uh, moments of change i think it started off uh, with uh, the introduction or the scrapping of uh, entry loads in mutual funds uh, i think the way was shown uh, by the regulator that uh, i want to reduce financial intermediary costs i think uh, that was one huge moment the other i think has been the realization amongst i think all wealth management firms wealth managers that there exists a huge conflict of interest or there existed a huge conflict of interest and in some cases i think it is there existed or there exists a huge conflict of interest between let's say 
I as a banker and a gentleman as a uh, or a lady as a as a as a client. And how does one remove these conflicts of interest? I think the biggest conflict was that I as a banker would get paid by the manufacturer, whereas the advice would be going to the client. And the fact that over periods of time, the regulatory changes which have come in, making the RIA concept or the investment advisory concept cleaner and cleaner and, and more sharper. And, and I still think there's, there's uh, 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 things going to keep happening. Uh, so that to me was the was the other big thing or the removal or the eradication of conflicts of interest. People taking clear stands uh, of whether they want to be in the manufacturing space, whether they want to be in the distribution space, or whether they want to be in the advisory space. And uh, uh, so if, if you look at uh, uh, these two or three changes, I think have been have been huge. Uh, I I also believe that uh, at the beginning uh, it was hardcore uh, uh, selling what you thought was what you wanted to sell or what you thought was right or what you wanted to sell to the client. But I think the realization is again clearly there with uh, with every wealth manager or every wealth management firm that it's now clear that you can you can and you should and you will or people are uh, recommending things which the client wants or creating things which the client wants rather than the other way around so i think it's a combination of uh, financial intermediary costs coming down dramatically and i still think it will keep coming down um, second is uh, the, the conflict of interest removal, uh, uh, one by people who did it themselves, and the other is regulatory. And of course, the fact that products being designed more uh, suitable, or I won't use the word suitable, uh, products being designed according to client wants rather than what the banker wants. Interesting. You know, one of the things uh, uh, when, when you talk, I'm also just harking back in terms of uh, the journey all of these years. Uh, one of the things I realized is that when we are all in the midst of change, we are too close to the mountain to see how big it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so from that point of view, you know, while seeing all of those, uh, uh, you know, changes happening in the landscape at a personal level, you know, uh, you have nurtured, built up and scaled up businesses. If you look back all of these years, what are the changes you have made as a professional to remain contemporary without knowing what regulation will persist, how things will change? What are the few things you've done to remain contemporary as a professional? You know, uh, I think this is uh, across. Uh, uh, I, I'll actually try breaking this up into two parts. Hmm. Uh, one is uh, uh, the overarching piece of technology and uh, the fact that I am now part of Kotak Securities, I keep saying this to everyone that I run a tech company or I try to run a tech company which happens to be in the securities broking business. Uh, because uh, what uh, it's been now two years for me uh, uh, in Kodak security. And I am absolutely clear about it that uh, technology is going to play or has played such an important role in uh, financial services. And it's just the beginning. Uh, in any business, I mean, uh, if you're specifically going to talk of wealth management, I see that happening in, in huge ways. It has ha already happened. Uh, and I see that continuing to happen. 
so to me the the digitization the technology drive which uh, uh, is happening in financial india or in uh, the entire bfsi space or the financial services space in india is at a pace which is unparalleled it's got even more uh, accentuated with uh, covid what was the the before covid zone or the bc zone as we loosely call it uh, and what is the dc zone or during covid zone as i as i, as I see it uh, the, the the changes are just completely crazy and i say this uh, with uh, all seriousness that professionals in the financial services space who will not uh, uh, stick to these day or, or will not change with the times uh, on technology will become extinct so to me uh, i i think that's one of the the biggest uh, uh, changes which i have seen but apart from that if you are specific on uh, uh, the wealth management space i'd briefly mentioned it uh, earlier i think uh, the the advisory model uh, which i think uh, practically every wealth management firm worth its salt today uh, has or the the family office model which uh, people uh, offer to clients i think are really clear uh, change moments which which i've seen in my career very interesting i think the penny drop when you said we are a technology company incidentally we also do broking to paraphrase an ad very interesting yeah it, it, it is it is actually uh, uh, i i don't think uh, i track uh, daily active users monthly active users and maybe so would a zomato or so would a swiggy or so would any of uh, uh, the tech firms and i think uh, uh, and i didn't know the words mao and dao uh was something which i knew nothing about uh, when i was part of uh, the priority bank or the nr business or the wealth management business because uh, but uh, yeah it's never too late to learn <laughs> sachin you want to go ahead yeah sure yeah so jaydeep uh, you know like as you said in terms of what you've seen the structural changes in the business actually over last probably last few decades and uh, if i have to drop parallel say for example if we see the broking business uh, if we go two decades back or maybe about two and a half decades back when it was a physical uh, the ring that we call it in the bombay stock exchange uh, you know the brokers used to have 100 bips 150 bips as commissions there used to be the jobbing uh, margins and all of that and from there probably that inflection point that came in is what the nsc digital terminals or the electronic terminals and then obviously the 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 margins the intermediary cost has just been sliding down uh, from 100 bips to probably now 1 bip or maybe now it's even lump sum kind of thing but the absolute profits uh, probably at a pool level has also grown significantly like zero the itself is now probably doing maybe 500 to 1000 crores kind of profits and so many other brokers in the last so many years in fact i remember uh even about uh, 15 years back or so uh or maybe about not 15 maybe 12 13 years back when i attended the kotak uh, one of the kotak analyst meets and uh, you know the profit was like uh, 500 crore and i was like it used to be the network aspiration of the companies of broking of 500 crore whereas you know the profit now was about 500 crore so so we've gone through that big uh, structural change that in spite of the yields coming down significantly uh the overall pool profit pool has actually exponentially grown on the wealth management side are we into that kind of a phase now where probably you know the market is getting matured in the sense that the, there are more and more large families uh, wanting to look for professional advice for managing their wealth you have much more matured wealth managers now uh and on the other side the the regulator is clearly working on getting the intermediary cost as you rightly said in terms of effectively the commission significantly lower but do you think that this this advisory 
piece that the that the regulator has gone in is that an inflection point over you know it has has it set the ball rolling for the next maybe one decade two decade for this business to now get into the next week i mean to completely a different zone but you got me too many questions so let me try uh jadi before you answer that just let me give you one anecdote uh, here not an anecdote i just ran this poll i'm so sorry to cut you but this is very interesting such as suggested a lot of structural changes that have happened but i ran this simple poll i think my financial advisor is ready for the next phase of uh, you know growth or next phase of wealth creation it's surprisingly only 33% feel that their advisors will be you know are they confident that their advisors will be able to meet up to the challenge okay while we are evolving every day so you know that is what i wanted to point out ki uh, you know have that parents in mind as well okay uh <laughs> let me let me try taking a shot at uh, uh what will what do i think uh, uh or what do i see happening in wealth management um and uh, people who happen to be in the wealth industry will have to Uh, excuse me if my thoughts are dated because i have not been part of the wealth business uh for the last 2 to 1 half years uh but um, let me and you know at at a point of time uh if and i am saying this with all humility and not asking anyone on the call uh to to think that uh, i'm i'm trying to trying to be little any any size or any of that kind but the sheer size of wealth which is increased in our country is mind blowing uh we would at a point of time uh have starting uh, uh wealth management business would start for clients at a figure of maybe 25 lakhs or 50 lakhs in one crore today there are wealth management firms which would have min ticket sizes of 5 or 10 or you know that kind of uh, numbers the kind of focus which uh, i think is there and will be there going forward in wealth management firms of uh, specific focuses on Uh, professionals on nris on uh, what in kotak is loosely called stake sale transactions uh, i think uh, uh, it's going to it's going to see a uh, a huge change and as uh, uh, the the ipo market is becoming bigger and bigger the venture capital market is becoming bigger and bigger uh, stake sales have been happening and it's now maybe i don't know 8 10 years that uh, there've been uh, uh, people who've been wanting to exit businesses or have exited businesses and created liquidity for that and if people have that kind of surplus which is uh, a few hundred million dollar kind of surpluses or half a half a billion dollar kind of surpluses at that stage to expect that they would want uh the same level of uh, uh service which they were getting when their amounts were 100th of that is also very wrong on part of wealth management firms and that's where customization comes in in and in will keep coming uh that's where costs will come down dramatically that's where products will get manufactured specifically for those for those families that's where custodian businesses will will become important because people will not want to uh want will, will want professional custodians to just just keep their assets with that's where uh, trusteeship businesses will come in uh, for for managing uh, uh for managing uh, a succession it's it's getting very imminent that a lot of families uh, want one leg uh, of their next generation uh, to not be uh, a country alone and they want to explore businesses outside 
So I think the concept of uh, international uh, 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 jurisdictions is going to become critical. I think uh, the overarching uh, uh, thing around uh, everything which I've seen is is tax. People want advice to not only uh, come from from uh, uh, their tax advisory people, but expect their wealth manager to have a, a division within their uh, uh, firm, which would which would give them advice on on uh, domestic tax. Uh, international tax and i have seen all of that happening or one is one is uh, tried creating all of that that this is what the customer wants this is what the client wants and you have to do it uh, because uh, the classic one stop shop is what a wealth outfit should be i think uh, uh, you you're bang on I, I i i see costs even coming down even more uh how well will uh, active fund management uh be part of uh, or how much or what portion of active fund management will be part of uh, families uh, large families is something which uh, uh, which uh, only time will tell uh, i happen to be on a few uh, family office advisory boards Uh, of uh, people I've been close to and who were part of the uh, wealth management business when I was part of it, and uh, when your when your sums of money are a couple of hundred million dollars, at that point of time, every basis point counts. Oh, so I think it's going to be a combination of all of this, and uh, the one factor which is going to be there, which is going to clearly. Uh, be i think a, a thumb rule for for everyone is that if you are not going to be uh, cost conscious for the client going forward uh, that's not going to be the way uh, being uh, or being with the client for a long time and what do you have to do as a wealth management firm for that i, I don't know opex uh, reduce opex dramatically uh, i think i think uh, the concept of uh, benchmark strategies is going to just just rule the roost i i'm not saying this because i happen to be part of a security firm but uh, i've seen this uh, i was guilty of that uh, in uh, as well that um, i see a huge increase in uh, people wanting to be part of direct equities i see a huge increase of uh, people being uh, uh, wanting to be part of uh, of uh, direct investments into unlisted equities or uh, uh, venture capital funds or private equity funds so it's it's a uh, it's a it's a a see which i uh, or a change which i see uh, which is just at the beginning or maybe And in the first quartile, and if what uh, Shankalpo's uh, poll says that only one third of the people uh, believe that uh, their wealth management firm is ready or their wealth manager is ready, maybe yeah, I, I respect that. Interesting. Yeah. So Jaydeep, uh, you know, you know, one of the very important points that you made is in terms of the conflict of interest uh, from the advisor and from the client's perspective. and i think if i go back again to the broking days i mean that's a special industry where we all are very close to i think as soon as the transparency came in uh, after the electronic trading and after because of the dmat and you know for the seamlessness of the whole thing do you think the the, the conflict in the wealth management uh, with this advisory mandate which has come into play now from the regulator can actually you know be a can actually be a stepping stone in terms of you know blooming the business big time you know like the multi like the amount of uh, the corpus which is today under the advisory business can actually go significantly multifold because now the advisor is actually just going to work from the perspective of the investor as you said for his cost because india, india will change india will change very fast and you know i've learned one thing that uh, 
when change happens, it happens so fast that you, before you say whatever, Robinson Crusoe, the change is happening. And I see that happening consistently, whether it's on what you mentioned of uh, I3 uh, uh, people or whatever. But where creation in India is happening at a pace, and if from a the current levels of uh, close to a three trillion dollar economy, one gets to the, the the five trillion dollar economy. The 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 creation of wealth is going to be so huge again that uh, and it's going to percolate at all levels. I think it's it's. It's not only going to be uh, a particular set of people uh, which will which will uh, 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 make the money. I think it's overall. If the economy is going to go to five trillion, uh, we, I mean, yes, the last couple of years uh, has been a dampener from a from a GDP growth point of view. But if the economy is is going to go to a five trillion dollar economy, the wealth creation in our country is going to be huge. If the wealth creation in our country is going to be humorous, people will require genuine, solid, professional advice. And it is up to the firms in our country of what stand they want to take, whether they want to be a manufacturer of the investment product, whether they want to be a distributor of the investment product, or they want to be an advisor to uh, the client. And I think all three have a huge role to play going forward. But it's going to be stands which individual firms, individual owners, individual CEOs will have to take that they want to be in all three. I, I think all three is tough. It's got to be a combination of two out of three is what I see happening. But it's calls which, which uh, uh, firms have to take. Yeah, so that's, a, that's again a very interesting point. And I'm going to now uh, turn the tables the other way around, saying that, you know, uh, you know, we, we know about this, that the, that the wealth management firms have to have a very high amount of integrity in terms of uh, with their clients and, you know, completely under the client's interest. But at the same time, they are grappling with in terms of the lower margins uh, or lower... Integrity. I don't think there's any option to that, Sachin. Then they better not be in the business because if they believe yeah. that... Uh, I want to be in the early 2000s or the early 2010s, taking those kind of margins. I think margins will. There is no. There is no doubt in my mind that margins are going to come under pressure. There's going to be. I, I mean, I. I'm today part of a business which has zero brokerage. <laughs> It can't go lower than that. Yeah. yeah. And as you said, that there are firms which are making uh, profits, which are very, very handsome profits uh, uh, over the last couple of years. And I see that happening. It, it, is, it is going to happen. India will, will clearly move from being a nation of savers to a nation of investors because as you have situations of interest rates being at these levels, which is not even beating inflation. It is going to, it is bound to happen. It's staring at us in the face that it is going to happen. That we will necessarily have to change from being, or Indians at large will necessarily have to change from being a nation of savers to being a nation of investors. And it's, it's happening. I mean, we all know, or we all read about this, the number of, uh, DMAT accounts which are getting opened, the number of new customers which are going into uh, into uh, these, uh, uh, the number of new mutual fund folios created, the number of SIPs uh, which is growing. I saw the last count was I think close to ten thousand crores now. It's staring at us in the face, and if uh, uh, if this number is to this number will definitely multiply. It's not going to be a pure, simple, uh, uh, nominal vidwa growth, as I used to call it. It's going to be good, solid growth. So it is going to be, it's just a matter of time. But uh, if people believe that the percentage of margins 
which was being made even two years ago will continue to be made i i wish the luck but mujhe nahi lagta hai koi bhi aisa soch raha hai i don't think i don't think they are, they are but they are, they are finding some ways out right like they will try to have some exclusive product they will have try to have some captive product where they can have some extra they'll push like you know out of a basket of five products i'll push one product which will have a higher margin you know like, you like such uh, you know i i i i um i understand your your line of questioning but uh, you know uh, if this was something which was uh, uh, maybe half a decade ago i would have said ha uh, but today believe me i think if a wealth management firm is serious uh, and i think wealth management firms today are serious i think wealth management firms realize that what is the potential in telling a wrong thing to a right customer and losing him for life the life value of that client is so high on an npv basis i don't think it's in anyone's mind to do this if it is happening it will not happen for a very long time i can i i am very sure of that but then the wealth managers only keep on changing their jobs so frequently <laughs> Uh, again uh, the the answer to that and i'm not trying to uh, protect my earlier uh, profession but um, i think that also is changing that also is changing i mean the fact that uh, uh, there are there are wealth managers and you you can pick on maybe a particular percentage but there are a reasonably decent percentage of people uh who've been in the wealth management industry for for more than a decade there are firms which have been formed uh, uh more than a decade ago and uh, and people have been part of those firms for reasonably long periods of time so it it each each of these uh, uh industries will have its own uh use but uh, i i i don't think uh, it's it's good to catch everyone with uh, or try to catch everyone with the same nest no sure I, frankly I, so uh, such a yeah. i think uh, sorry i am just going to be this is this is this is a very interesting discussion but uh, i am just going to be uh, interjecting with two points one is i think uh, amazing questions are coming in from the audience point of view uh, and i have some uh, very naive questions i want to ask jaydeep myself so you know i am going to be asking you to just let a uh, few of our questions come in and then maybe we can continue it and we are now already in 40 minutes into the conversation the number of questions are coming in the number of people are going up so i don't see this uh, stopping in a hurry right so jaydeep uh, one question which i have which is going to be a little bit away from uh, public markets in a way uh, when i started thinking about this question when i started writing about it india had 21 new unicorns till yesterday it was 22 i believe now it is 23 so <laughs> the 23 new unicorn still date which means that you know uh, uh, the value of new age is new age businesses in this country is probably being recognized and it is going to the roof uh, not surprisingly it is also getting a lot of participation from uh, indian investors indian hnis family offices in these private markets it's inevitable i guess uh, both on the credit and equity side my fundamental question uh, it's it's uh, broken into two parts what are the challenges these businesses will face once they come into mainstream public markets and the second thing is how should these investors who are already into private equity uh, or into the private markets when these businesses go public what should be their course of action uh you've got enough of examples uh, because of uh, uh, firms which have which have uh, gotten into the public market space uh okay you won't have enough examples but there are few examples which are there today uh, of people who have got into public markets having been predominantly private for a reasonably long period of time i think the big issue which they would face is that uh, today they were answerable only to maybe a few dozen or not even maybe few dozen maybe a few handful of investors or a few handful of shareholders 
and it was it was them which they were uh, asked to do. i think uh, once the public market thing is is opening up and they are they've taken a call to be in front of the public market i think the scrutiny levels are going to get higher and higher but i again uh, uh, don't believe that uh, uh, they're not ready for it they 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 learn i mean it's 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 a process which uh, which is just a matter of time where uh, some of them will make a few mistakes uh, uh, on the way uh, some will struggle and some will uh, see them see the the uh, people struggling or making the mistakes and those mistakes will not happen in the future from an investment point of view or an investor point of view people who have invested in uh, uh, these unlisted spaces either through funds or uh, directly i think the call which uh, the family office or the ultra high net worth individual and i think i would restrict it as of now only to to, to these two categories of uh, investors in the hni space uh, who have invested in these unlisted equities uh it's it's a call which uh, they their family offices themselves the families uh, would end up taking whether they want to exit part of it during the ipo whether they want to remain in it for a for a longer haul but what i see happening very clearly is that i see more and more participation coming about in the unlisted space in the venture capital space in the angel investment space from a completely different set of uh, individuals uh, than what it was in the past and that is uh, heartening at the same point of time i would uh, uh, put in a word of caution as well uh, to investors who are getting into the unlisted space do not allocate large sums of money or large percentages of your assets into the unlisted space uh dip your toes dip your feet experience listed equity and then look at unlisted equity uh don't take a call saying that i'll go first full hog uh, full hog into into unlisted because the kind of returns which my my friendly neighbor has made is is so huge that uh, i'm also going to make that it doesn't happen so easily but i see that happening but i see the the uh, uh, unlisted space getting much more subscribed to by a far more uh, wider set of people than before interesting i think the analogy which you gave about uh, dip your toes dip your feet uh, the swimming analogy i was told by when i was learning swimming dip your feet dip your toes dip your trunks but make sure you don't dip your nose udhar aane ke pehle just make sure you are you learn how to swim and i think that is true for all markets which you talk about particularly i think uh, for private equity markets right now i think that's very useful information i actually had a question but you already answered that so i'm just going to turn it into a comment before i hand it back to sachin uh, about democratization of uh, the wealth management business in terms of advice i think there is there is so much of information out there the client has become savvier uh information which used to be at the premium you know which is uh, restricted to a particular sort of uh, uh, advisor or entity i think it is getting more and more democratized and which is one of the reasons why probably the costs are also dropping in a way for advisory no, so uh, because I'll, i'll 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 also add one more thing i think it's uh, also important uh, and i hope uh, uh, on this call there are investors as well uh i would sincerely request that uh, don't put undue pressure on your wealth manager or your advisor to say that i want returns which are high double digit returns or very well very well seen returns because it is not possible if the net worth of our if the gdp of our country is going to be growing at a particular percentage uh, the the underlying stocks or the underlying companies which are part of the gdp are also growing at that same percentage so if the gdp is going to be growing at sub 10 then to expect high double digit kind of returns in equities is not correct by putting pressure on the wealth manager you might end up asking him to do 
things which are more risky for your portfolio which ultimately will not be good for the financial health so i think it's 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 a it's a request to investors as well uh, that uh, be 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 very reasonable in your expectations of what is the return which one should be making it was very nice to think that i could make a a post tax return of uh, 12 to 15% in equities but that was a time when taxation rates were not there in long term equities that was a time when the inflation numbers were not of 6 7 8% and at that point of time it was easier to make that kind of return but at inflation numbers which are there today the way they are uh, to expect uh, those kind of uh, percentages i would i would sincerely request uh, people to be reasonable in that manager expectations understood such a over to you sure sure thank you yeah uh, so jaydeep i i completely agree with everything that you said and it's just that sometimes i try to be a devil's advocate uh, you know in my typical habit of being a research analyst and a fund manager when we go and meet the management we try to you know get sense that but what we are thinking let's get a reaffirmation from there but i i completely agree with everything that you mentioned uh, you know what we've also seen in the recent years is that uh, you know if if i go back to again when we started our careers uh you know the working uh, the mncs had a uh, had a, had you know they were the leaders in as far as the wealth management is concerned even the aspirations of the wealth managers would be to work with an mnc wealth management firm but in the last few years the firms like yours and a couple of large uh, firms have actually uh, taken the pole position uh how how do you see this now trend from here on do you do you see that you will be able to further capitalize on on this trend as a business Uh, it's a very good question, Sajjan. Uh, and I <clears throat> used to. I don't think I any longer uh, do it. But if there's help which any of my ex-colleagues uh, want, I I obviously uh, try providing my inputs, whatever however shallow they might be. But I think uh, the the big differentiator uh for a wealth management firm is going to be whether you're part of a bank or a non bank when it becomes a non bank you're talking of whether you're part of a broking entity or a nbfc entity when you're part of a bank again break it up into two parts whether you're independent uh or the wealth management business is independent whether the wealth management business is part of the consumer bank or the wealth management business is part of the wholesale bank so you can have any of these five verticals under which the wealth management firms can sit that is i repeat standalone bank ke standalone entity which is what uh, kotak was and 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 uh, is uh, part of the consumer bank part of the wholesale bank part of uh, or if you are not part of a bank and you are part of either a broking entity or you are part of an nbfc entity uh now there could be uh, some cases which could be out of these five as well but i think if you if you break it up it would all form part of one of these five yeah i think an asset management business could be the sixth uh uh a pure simple foreign entity could be a seventh so but but I, th- th- these are the broad uh, uh, places uh again i think each firm needs to take a call on what or how does it want to intend to grow i think what i have experienced is that uh, uh in this convoluted space of or complicated space of finance and advisory being critical the kind of clients you are talking to the in the wealth management i think uh, uh, from a bank perspective if you are part of the wholesale bank uh, or if you are part of an independent outfit which has reasonably decent working relationships with the wholesale bank and when i mean wholesale bank 
It could be the investment bank for mergers and acquisitions, for IPOs. It could be the corporate bank for lending. It could be the mid-market segment again for lending. It could be ease of transactions. Uh, so it's really a combination of uh, what is it that you think your client base is and what is it your client base wants. And then adjusting your, your offerings and your structure accordingly. Uh, similarly, uh, if you're if you're a standalone broking entity which which wants to to offer wealth management business or a standalone asset management business which wants to offer wealth management, I think it's it's just where do you think the sweet spot lies for you is what you need to figure out. And as I said, the difference for us in Kota was the fact that. Uh, It's it's a it's a universal wealth management kind of a situation with uh, a lot of working relationships with uh, various parts of, uh, of the group because ultimately the client decides uh, what the offering should be and you have to figure a way out within your system of how you're going to offer that if he if he wants. Uh, uh, an investment banking advice, you would ideally or you should ideally uh, uh, be in a position to give him that within the group. And if you can, then it's just more and more strengthening of the relationship. And I think that's that's where uh, uh, wealth management firms have made or broken themselves. Sure. Perfect. How you how you decided to structure your uh, uh, business internally? Right. So basically, have your focus. Get your uh, get your audience absolutely uh, uh, your mark, and then that's where you get your business. Right. Uh, you know. You, earlier, you also mentioned about <clears throat> that. Uh, you know that you happen uh, that you are in a technology business, and you happen to be in a securities business. Any any two or three trends in the fintech space which where which is which is on your radar or which is like it's you know you you are really very much focused on any any two or three trends that you would like to talk about in the fintech space. I would call it the fintech space, Sachin. I would just say, um, how is digitization going to uh, <clears throat> become bigger and bigger? I'll, I'll give you very small examples, and it necessarily has to be the focus of uh, of uh, firms, whether they happen to be in the securities business or they happen to be in uh, the food delivery business or they happen to be in uh, a small payment bank or or whatever. Uh, at a point of time, okay, a broking account used to take seven days to get open. Okay, uh, today. I think it would be 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Now, that is the extent of uh, the role which uh, the uh, technology piece or the digital digital piece has has done. And I've seen this happen in front of my eyes. When I, and, and when I say change happens and you don't realize it. Uh, and there are people I know who are trying to get that down to four minutes. Four minutes for a broking account to get opened, obviously subject to X, Y, Z uh, sets of parameters. But that is the extent of uh, focus which is there on today uh, DIY or do-it-yourself kind of thing. Uh, I, and I, it's it's um, you know uh, again in the tech space, uh, wealth is not it's not simple. It's a complicated thing. I mean, you've got a wealth uh, a, a client who's got uh, money with five different uh, mutual funds, six different PMS managers, three different AIF managers, uh, two different uh, venture, ca uh, venture capitalists would be part of AIF, would have some part uh, 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 in uh, the 250,000 LRS. He wants to know one consolidated report for himself. Now, you, your technology needs to necessarily provide him that. And People who will succeed in doing this will be the preferred wealth managers. And if they charge you 
a few bits more, you'll still happily pay it. Uh, I think uh, I, I didn't mention anything about the emotional quotient or the relationship manager uh, field. I think um, it's uh, it, it's going to play continue to play a very very important role. There are going to be people uh, who'll who'll uh, shift businesses because their wealth manager has shifted or relationship manager has shifted. So I think it's going to be a combination of uh, tech, human interface, but. I, you know, I, I used to say this uh, uh, frequently at the beginning of my career that it's uh, this business is about people and product. Uh, I then changed my philosophy to say it was product first and then people. Today, I think it's a combination of people, product, process, and platform. And product is not the way we normally understand product. Product is the entire offering which you're putting in front of the client. And that to me is product. Is the platform which you're offering it, your uh, uh, offerings on, is that friendly to the customer? Is he happy uh, in the entire process? Is it, is it uh, too complicated? Are you asking him too many signatures? Are you going to uh, keep... Uh, how how easy can you make it for... So it's really now, to me, four Ps. It's people, and, I, and I... It's not only for the wealth business, actually. I think this extremely strongly in the, in the uh, securities business, which I'm currently part of. It is uh, platform, product, people, process is what I... Uh, and do you have an order for that? What comes first, what comes second? Like as you said, first it was people, then product, then you changed it to Today, product. I think it, today from a securities firm point of view, I'd say platform. Okay. First and then everything else. Okay, interesting. Very interesting. interesting. Very interesting. You have any thoughts for asset management firm? What would it be? I'm asking from my perspective. <laughs> Make money for the client, man. No, that's what to share. <laughs> <laughs> you make money for the client, the client will come to you. <laughs> but I think, uh, I think, uh, uh, I think yeah. we're running out of time as well. Uh, uh, anyway, but I think uh, two things which I think. Uh, or two and a half things which I think will explode in India is uh, uh, benchmark funds, ETS, because of the fact that uh, uh, people are happy or content with getting indexed returns. Uh, so they would obviously, if they get a couple of hundred basis points more, uh, they're not going to say no to it at all. But at what cost is is going to be there is going to be their mantra. And the second, which I'm surprised hasn't happened at the pace at which I thought it would happen, uh, is long term hedge funds. I think um, it is just a matter of time before uh, hedge funds or long short strategies become become far more uh, uh, bigger and. It could be just an X factor there rather than a pure simple percentage increase. I wouldn't be surprised if the industry becomes, I don't know, 5X in the next couple of years. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. <clears throat> what do you mean? Uh, uh, no, I think, uh, you know, I've been enjoying myself listening to this. You know, I've never seen a fund manager so actively involved in discussing. I think you really were putting on a research analyst hat. I, I don't want to interrupt the conversation at all. In fact, in the interest of time and in terms of the quality of questions which are coming in, I will probably not ask you any further questions. I'm going to ask Sankalpo to take over because some of the questions are really amazing. I think you should look at those. Sankalpo? Sure. So we'll take some questions from the chat. And the first question that I'm going to take is from Pooja. So she asks, can wealth management or you know financial services be more uh, you know uh, broad-based when they give their advice? Like she gave the specific example. Okay. Uh, that I began a monthly sip of 10 grams of gold, but then I realized I was never given such a such a plan by any advisor. Okay, similarly, when I was thinking about it, if somebody told me when I was 10, 
you know you could start an sip and you could buy your first bike with that when you were 20 or you know you could fund a part of your education when you when you are 20 with that save that you did for the last 10 years okay so can this kind of advice more centric to a broader base of investors okay and not just one size uh, fits all kind of approach uh, you know which i'm not saying is happening today a lot has happened uh, you know wealth managers take you know uh, that on their stride and try to devise individual plans but can that become more broad based where we cater such things also i think it is uh, going to happen uh, shankal it's again a matter of time before it happens i think uh, it's a very uh, good question which uh, pooja has raised I I I I see it happening. Uh, in fact, there's some thing happening. I know for a fact. Uh, but this is going to be far more digital. This is going to be far more uh, uh, standardized than customization coming into it. Uh, I think I think uh, goals, life goals, uh, uh, acquisition goals, and when I mean acquisition goals. i mean uh, uh, buying a bike as you said or buying a house uh, at, at a particular age or 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 uh, saving up for a for a, a us vacation i think all of this is going to become uh, uh, standardized templates which are going to be obviously based on certain uh, uh, thoughts of the advisory firm but it's just a matter of time before you see this or all of this are uh, coming about and, uh, whether it's 10 grams of gold whether it's uh, uh 50000 rupees ka sip whether it's uh, 5 lakh rupees ka sip it's really going to depend on what is it that you want to achieve uh, but you see such standard templates coming on i do that i do definitely right. that happy and we hope it comes sooner than later it will it will it will i wouldn't be i would be uh, I I I think you'll see it this calendar year, man. Oh, <laughs> so Pooja, that's that's answering for you, and I hope uh, such things do come soon for the benefit of all. Uh, you know, my uh, the next question which I like, uh, Vikas and Sachin, feel please feel free to choose from the chat as well. So <laughs> we've asked this question again and again to a lot of people, and we also ourselves as advisors get uh, you know asked about this question, which is about uh, RMs changing jobs frequently, and it's infamous in our industry. Okay, I mean. it's just you know it's just an elephant in the room but you have been a veteran with one organization you've handled teams you've handled many many uh, uh, teams you have stayed uh, and built organizations you've stayed with this organization through thick and thin what do you think of this and how do investors take it you know look at uh, you know this thing about our uh, you know industry financial services is <coughs> a tough question shankal uh i don't have a, i don't have a, a standardized ready made answer for this uh my uh, submission would be select the firm and then uh decide on the wealth manager because if the firm is right if the processes of the firm is right if the product selection of the firm is right if the safety uh, risk management compliance of that firm is right irrespective of who the wealth manager is or who the relationship manager is you will continue to be in safe hands so don't uh, get carried away with the fact that uh, that uh, my wealth manager was with a bank first or b uh, wealth management now and he's gone to c then he's gone to e uh, don't think of that my humble suggestion would be decide on the wealth management firm first and there's no harm in having a couple of wealth management firms uh, and uh, i i've seen this that people have have are very comfortable with uh, having two or three wealth management firms obviously depends on the size of the asset size of the the funds you are placing with that firm but uh, you will eradicate this problem in its entirety if you decide that this firm I'll stick with it's interesting that you sorry it's around this firm all right the compliance on this firm right the risk management is right 
the product selection is right the process is simple platform is good that's that's what i can say in fact i just before you go to the next question it's interesting uh, because sachin was asking a question in terms of ranking of parameters you talked about platform process product people and you said platform is first when i hear you very carefully i'm getting the feeling that maybe process is second you know and that is that is something which might be of use to uh, our viewers sankal would please go ahead sure so the next uh, the other question that i want to ask is uh, you know you spoke about so this is something again we have seen in the industry happen everywhere i think uh, you know uh, not sticking to any particular geography but uh, two three players become very large and start having four uh, 40 40 40 50% 60% market share okay across financial services uh, what do you think then becomes the risk okay uh, this i think uh, susmit patodia asked this question in response to your uh, you know companies becoming large and opex coming down lower so what do you think of those risks coming to india uh, i think firms will become big or bigger uh, if they have again i go back to the same old thing that if they have their uh, eyes set on the right focus and uh, do what is absolutely absolutely customer centric and right for the for the client they will uh, or it will become bigger and bigger and bigger all i can advise uh, every wealth management firm and maybe i've am lack of hair and gray hair and i can afford to say that uh, that uh, if we focus on the right parameters for a client uh, we will become big it's only by focusing on the right parameters that uh, firms will become of some substance in this business yeah otherwise um, there there are, there will there will be issues uh, going forward from a uh, survival point of view and it's not been easy the last of a decade or a decade has not been easy i've seen uh, 92 i've seen 97 i've seen 99 yeah. i've seen 2008 i've seen 2014 so it's it's uh, it has uh, its own set of uh, troubles going ahead right so because the last question that i can take and then maybe if, if you can select a few from the audience question which i think is like again a very interesting question sorry because i'm picking all the interesting ones first no no it's okay it's okay it's <laughs> so okay. uh i think two people have asked this question uh vikas uh, vikas kothari and uh, someone else also asked this question what is the bigger what will be a bigger disruptor going ahead when we you know multiply the wealth tech or regulations you know according to you regulator will never be a disruptor actually regulator will be an enhancer uh, Uh, in the long run uh, for uh, firms becoming uh, or uh, processes becoming cleaner neater etc etc so you might have uh, very short term blips in uh, uh, business or profitability because of some regulation which has come which might have hit one and not hit the other but the biggest disruptor is going to be tech uh, and uh, i mean uh, i was i was uh, a wealth management firm based out of singapore has uh, and and catch hold of your seats for this has 2500 people in technology and uh, 500 bankers but 2500 people in technology five times five times five times the number of bankers now maybe that five times will become three times going forward because you might not now add as many tech people as you would add bankers but uh, to me tech is going to be the single biggest um and i say this with so much of conviction and passion or belief because i'm seeing this happen in my in my business to a dramatic extent and uh, i would urge all wealth management firms to to 
keep to this. So, Sachin, uh, I think you can take one question. I'll take one question before we wrap up. Uh, please go ahead. Sure. I I have actually a lot of questions. As you can see, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. But <laughs> just just one thing, and that I think it's a function of what I want to really understand is that you know, last two decades, as we all are seeing, that something that we are in the midst of the whole thing where we are so close, uh, we miss it, right? So. Two decades back, the only thing that I had to do was just buy Kotak Bank and uh, Kotak shares, which we never bought. But that has been the biggest wealth creator, right? And uh, so, Jayanti, what I want to like to understand is that, to my mind, and which is what we talk about in our uh, research processes, the equal model, that the real wealth creation is a large part is I mean, the opportunity, business, everything is there for everyone. But it's the management which makes it or breaks it, and which capitalizes the real opportunity. Which is where Kotak as a group has done a phenomenal job in the last two decades in front of my eyes, uh, and I think the credit goes to the entire management team. And of course, the most important thing is that the management team has actually stuck there. I mean, the senior management team, maybe about more than two dozen people, or maybe even more, maybe twenty, thirty people, have been there for almost two decades now. So, what is the secret sauce for this? In the sense that why have you all stuck there and you haven't looked around like in so many businesses? In fact, I just got a. We just got this uh, news flash a few minutes back while we are here. Uh, Mr. Vinod Dasari has resigned from Aisha. So he was doing very well at Ashok Leyland. He came to Aisha. We were very much hopeful. He's again left. You know. So we we've seen this kind of portfolio, the management churn very regularly. But Kotak is one place, and again in an industry where there's the highest churn. I mean, which is our industry, we have the highest churn. But where Kotak is one place where we have seen the least amount of churn in the senior management team. So can can you throw some light? What has really played out so well? Uh, let me try taking a shot at this. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, it's a combination of uh, two or three things, uh, Sachin. When we set out to do what we set out to, there was no concept that the market cap is going to become so big that you know uh, that things will become five x or ten x or two hundred x or three hundred x or five hundred x. I think uh, if you ask me, I think it's the really the mentality of a lot of people in the senior management the complete simple humble mentality of people uh, that and the i i'll use the word middle class mentality of doing things the right way i don't think uh, anyone uh, would have thought except maybe uday would have thought that this kind of uh, uh, wealth creation could happen in this company called kodak mahindra bank and uh, when it happened you realized or that you were just extremely lucky to be part of it uh and you were part of it because uh, uh of uh, as i said uh, the value systems the culture the risk management systems the adherence to being on not even on the line but within the line and uh, i think it's a combination of all of this that uh, when it was when it was happening you didn't realize it was happening but when it happened then you just think that um, you've been uh, lucky to be at the right place at the right time and uh, there's no ostensible reason for you to give this up so it's actually a combination of as i said uh, uh, the cultures and the value systems which have been there in the in the uh, in in and around you for a while on period i don't know whether this is a 
answer which is but but i'm sure sure mr kotak also has a role to play in keeping the the heart together was i told you that it, it is the uh, as i said no one apart from him would have thought that this would have actually happened or maybe few people apart from him would have thought this would have happened i didn't know it it's interesting jaydeep that when you mentioning this i am reminded of this book i read called leaders eat last by simon sinek okay so pretty much a lot of things which you're saying it just it just i think these are the these are the definitive traits of any successful management team uh, i'm not going to such an if you through can i just uh, are you through yeah. with the question yeah, yeah. so yeah, i for my other questions next session with jaydeep <laughs> So I just want to thank a lot of people who've been posting questions. Sorry, uh, Cyrus and uh, Kashyap and Rajendra Shinde, uh, Anish Devasia, Amit Pandey. My goodness, how many people? Sushmit Patel already been asked. Pooja has been asked. Anand Sarore, Sunil Senani, Gorav Tiwari, SPS Johan, Vedant, uh, Finsaf, Manish Balwani, Rahul Chadda. Okay, there's one tongue-in-cheek question I'm going to come to from Nilesh Unswarkar. I just wanted to end that because it brought a smile to my lips. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have Risha Padukia, Vikash Kothari, Abit Pandey. Sorry if I missed out on any Pooja Birla, Shivendra Parihar. Uh, so this tongue-in-cheek question, which I can, I, I really smile. And I, if it's the same Nilesh Unswarkar, I know it is typical of him to ask this question. Which type of investors don't need a wealth manager? <laughs> i started smiling when i saw this <laughs> no i i will uh, 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 i'll answer this question i don't think anyone uh, doesn't need a wealth manager i think every 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 person uh, uh, needs a wealth manager uh, there can be different types of uh, involvement which you expect out of the wealth manager uh, some would be uh very low key some would be high high inte- high intent but uh, i don't think uh, if you have wealth you definitely definitely need a wealth manager uh, ergo if you need a, if you have a wealth manager you will definitely create wealth <laughs> so uh, i think uh, in terms of all the questions asked if it's okay with you jaydeep i think uh, pooja who asked the question on the the, the broad base versus the uh, uh the single sort of segmentation question should we give her the prize for the best question yes absolutely. absolutely okay congratulations pooja our team will be in touch with you uh so on behalf of uh, all of us uh, mk investment managers pms aif world and all the listeners who tuned in uh, on the viewers who tuned in thank you so much jyoti this has been uh, an amazing sort of a discussion i didn't even realize we have 1 1 hour 20 minutes time just passed by okay and uh, for me to keep quiet for so long is also very difficult so i think i completely enjoyed the discussion thank you so much for this thanks thank you thank you jay thank, thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you all of you for helping me and patiently listening to a to an old hag thank you very much <laughs> thank you so much jay thank you so much bye have a nice evening thank you